Hi, I'm Pastora Kate. I greet you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, who is come in the flesh. Welcome to Bridge Builders Bible Study. For details on how to join our live stream on Telegram, see the links in the description below. Now, let's prepare our hearts as we come before the Lord to learn how relevant His Word is for us in today's troubled times. Father God, we just come to you this morning and ask you for your encouragement, for strength, for help. We bless you. We praise your name. We just love you. Please encourage our hearts and everyone else who is probably going through difficulty and for those who are under attack from the enemy, I pray, Lord, that you would help us all to stand up in our spirit, rise up in faith that you are seeing us through. We, we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name. All right, we are at the series, part three of Irregular Warfare, and today we're telling the story of Deborah and Barak. Mm. But we're going to start off with a review first of irregular warfare. And each time we want to talk about this, we want to keep in mind what the irregular warfare is. <clears throat> the definition is a violent struggle among state and non-state actors for legitimacy and influence over the relevant populations. And in this case, Legitimacy would definitely be something that Satan strives for with his non-state kingdom of this world. He wants legitimacy, and he wants influence. This perfectly fits. The relevant populations for him is as many as he can drag down to the pit. We see that the state is truly the kingdom of God. This is the relevant population. This is the relevant kingdom. This is the one that, even though hidden from people's eyes, is the most important, the most influential. God didn't have to show everybody all of his cards. He didn't have to show everybody what he's doing in order for it to be powerful. And you can see that Satan wants his kingdom to supersede God's. We know this is what he's aiming for at the end. And so he's going to be as visible as necessary, and we notice over the last, I say over the last two decades, but it's even been speeding up more and more that they're manifesting themselves, showing themselves, showing their hand, showing what they're doing, because Satan has always been a little too cocky, a little too sure of himself, a little too sure that he's going to win, trying very hard to win. I think he's actually self-deluded and probably mental at the same time. Hmm. But I know that he hates God and he hates us, and the way to get to God is through us, to hurt us, to try to bring us down to the pit so that he can throw that in God's face. And this is what we're up against here. But I tell you that even though that's the case, we know that God wins. You know, I hear a lot of people sort of mouth those words, but they don't really know what it means. And if you knew exactly what it meant, you would feel so much conviction when you said it. And I hear people say, we win because God's on our side. And I say, not so. We win because we accept the blood of Jesus Christ that is given for us to cover our sins, to redeem us from death that we deserve, and to bring us into God's heavenly kingdom so that we are walking around on this earth with a physical body that's decaying and is going to die, but we have life everlasting. We have become immortal in the sense that we will have a new body. And the Bible says it has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we shall be like him. 
All right, as we go on today, try to, rem try to remember to see if you can pick out the state and the non-state actors in today's story. Our story comes from the book of Judges, which begins with the death of Joshua, who was the second to rule over the children of Israel after Moses. I'm going to begin with a description of the evil inhabitants that collectively made up the land of Canaan. These were the people that God intended for the children of Israel to wipe out as they moved into the inheritance, into the promised land that God had for them. A lot of people these days, especially Palestinians and anybody that they've been able to woo to their cause, like to sort of gloss over this part, or they want to make the Christians and the Jews terrible people because, oh, they want to take their ancestral land. The, the problem is that God said to take that land, and the land become, begins to God. I'm sorry, the land belongs to God. It's his. I want you to hear what kind of people these are so that you understand why God said to destroy them. The Canaanite deities, such as the Baals and the Ashtoreths, remained a problem for Judah until the Babylonian exile. Other Canaanite deities included the Asherahs and Dagon. It took 70 years in captivity to finally cure the Israelites of their idolatrous ways. Recent archaeological discoveries have clarified some facts about the religion of Canaan in the days of the judges. Baal and Ashtoreth are the names of two individual gods in a much larger and complicated system of polytheism, but they were also community gods whose names differed from region to region. For instance, there was the Baal called Baal of Peor. That was a location, so it's the god of Peor, specifically Baal, and then Baal of Barith and Baal Zebub. It's for this reason that scripture describes the Israelites as serving Baal in some instances and then Baals in others, so plural. Overall, the religion of the Canaanites was extremely corrupt. It was characterized by the practices of human sacrifice, ritual prostitution, and homosexuality, and self-mutilation. These religions taught that these practices were prevalent among their gods, so it is not surprising that the people became equally debased. Many false gods were particularly connected with agriculture, the seasons, the weather, and grain, and some of God's judgments against these people would ultimately discredit the supposed abilities of these Canaanite gods. If you think back to when God led, or he had Moses lead, the children of Israel out of Egypt, every one of the ten plagues was a, an answer from God to the beliefs of the idols, the, the false gods, the people that served them. Every one of those plagues was also a way that God would use to discredit the gods of Egypt. So, now last week we met a very important state actor, and this was the angel of the Lord. In Exodus 23, verses 20 through 33, God said, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you in to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread 
and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among the peoples to whom you come and make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the sea, Philistia, and from the desert to the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. And as I'm looking over this promise, and we read this last week, I see that this angel is not a theophany. He's not Christ come to visit before Jesus is born among men. And the reason I know this is because in verse 21 he says, Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. So this angel's job was not to give mercy. This angel had one job, and I'm sure that he had a terrifying aspect. So let's see who this mysterious angel of the Lord actually is. <clears throat> the word used for angel is the term malak. And a malak could be an angel, ambassador, a king, or a messenger. Specifically, though, we see that this angel of the Lord was given great authority by God to deal with Israel. This was likely Michael, or, or in English we call him Michael, one of the chief angelic princes over Israel, who was an ambassador for the living God. That is, he spoke for God. Now, we can learn something about this prince from the book of Daniel. In Daniel 10.13, he said, this is, this is um, Gabriel speaking to Daniel, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Michael, according to Daniel, where it says chief prince of Rishon Sar, is a spiritual, immortal prince assigned by God to take care of Israel. We say angel. There are many different types of angels. We can be sure that this was a very formidable person. Well, Daniel 10, 20 and 21 says, Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Daniel was of Israel, and Gabriel is telling him that Michael is his prince. He's an archangel. So we can be pretty sure that the angel that went with Israel, that God assigned, was Michael. We must remember that although people change, God does not. So I believe that even as Michael was involved with Israel to watch and lead, that he is still active today. And I believe he's going to be until God's word is completely fulfilled. That says all Israel will be saved. There are many who are trying to say God rejected Israel. You know, God rejected Israel numerous times, but still set his love upon her and still wooed her and drew her back and 
even as Paul says in the New Testament, the salvation is of the Jews, and everything that God is going to do is first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And we need to be humble and grateful to be in our place and not try to supplant or replace Israel because we will receive anger from the Lord for that. All right, now that we know something about this Prince of Israel, let's proceed with our story in Judges. So Judges chapter 1, verses 27 through 36. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its villages, or Tanak and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblium and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. For the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. Now, I could go through all the ites here, and this is difficult for some people to understand the words, and I don't want you to get bogged down in it. I want you to understand that these are the tribes of Israel, because Israel is not one. Israel is not united. But these tribes who are moving into their assigned inheritance, the land that each one of them was assigned by God, they were supposed to drive the inhabitants out. That's what God said to do. But they didn't. It says, for the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. Later it says, because the inhabitants were determined to dwell in that land. Well, the, and Israel wasn't determined enough. This, the children of Israel, the tribes of Israel, were not determined enough. And so they gave in. They did exactly what they were told not to do. They allowed them to stay in their land that God had told them would be theirs. And they even thought, well, we'll just have them pay tribute. Well, the problem is when you allow someone in to just stay with you and pay tribute, eventually their practice practices will rub off on you. All right, so next, the angel of the Lord rebukes Israel. So Judges 2, 1 through 5, then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal, to Bohim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you. But they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Then they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Notice that they didn't sacrifice to the angel. They sacrificed to the Lord. They knew that much. They went into punishment. God turned them over to punishment. But it's important here to notice that God always warns you what's going to happen. God always warned the people. I'll bless you if you do this. I will curse you if you do this. Turn this way, follow me. If you don't do that, this is the punishment. The choice is yours. And you can think that you'll get out of it. But the fact is, unless you repent of your sin, you won't get out of it. But if you repent, which means turn around, change your mind, go the other way, then you can cry out for mercy. But it's not the job of the angel of the Lord to give mercy in this circumstance. All right, so let's see what happens here. Judges 2, 11 through 15. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. 
They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were greatly distressed. So God turns them over and says, <clears throat> I'm not going to help you now. And what did they do instead of repenting? Okay, sure, they, they, they built an altar and they wept. And then they said, well, guys, guess we're on our own. Let's go see which, which of the gods kind of, you know, appeals to us. And we'll just, you know, take a couple household gods and stash them in our tent. And maybe, you know, we'll light a lamp to them or something. It says that they served the Baals. They did not serve God anymore. They served the Baals. They forsook God. God is a person. We talked about that last time. God is a person. He has emotion. He has great love. God is the one who instilled emotions in us, but we don't always aim our emotions correctly. We're not holy in our emotions, but I assure you that God is. And God is a jealous God. He has a right to be jealous. He made us. He created us. We have no right to pass judgment on God. We're stupid to pass judgment on God. And I mean that in the literal sense of the word. Our brains are addled if we think we can pass judgment on God. And you're judging the very one that can help you. Instead of humbling yourself before him. We have to rip that saw off of the throne of our heart and put David there. So the people served Baal. They provoked God to anger. They served the Ashtoreths, and God's anger was hot. And so he turned them over. Remember, that's an echo of what Paul said in Romans. They didn't give thanks. They didn't acknowledge God. And they took the next step down into degradation until at the very end, God says he gave them over to an unclean, gave them over to all the unclean thoughts of their minds, gave them over. Remember when the man was caught in sin with his father's wife, but he was going to church. And Paul said, I don't know what you think you're doing allowing this and even thinking that you're liberal in, in allowing it. You're congratulating yourselves for allowing it. Paul said, I've already judged him as if I was there. You are to kick him out and turn him over to Satan so that perhaps his soul might be saved because Satan's going to buffet his flesh. And this is what God did. God understands sometimes Satan has to be used to bring somebody back to him. Satan is a bowflex. If you don't know how to use the bowflex, you can get hurt on it. But if you know how to use the bowflex, you understand Satan has no authority over you if you're standing in Christ and you have nothing to fear. He can make a lot of noise. He can't harm you unless you agree with some little stupid plot that he has. Unless you forget who God is, God doesn't do the walking the way we do. In verse 15, it says, Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity. Calamity is a terrible thing. Calamity is like when Job lost his whole family, and then his wife said, just curse God and die. He lost all of his Everything that he had, that's calamity. When a tsunami comes and tears down your whole village, that's calamity. Calamity is great. It's much greater than just one personal event that hurts you. Calamity is when everything in your life seems to be conspiring against you to tear you down. And God allows it when he needs to do something in us. 
It says they were greatly distressed. Well, they certainly were distressed. They had it so good. God led them so wonderfully. But just like the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, the very first thing they did before they even crossed over the Red Sea, they were grumbling. God had patience with them for a while. Moses had patience for a while. And eventually Moses said, I can't deal with these people, Lord. And of course God said, oh, yes, you will. But then God gave judges to the people. We want to find out who these judges are because it very much concerns what we're talking about today. So God raised up leaders to lead the children of Israel. These were people who could judge in the affairs of the children of Israel. There were 15 judges, and 13 of them were written of in the book of Judges. And 1 Samuel mentions Eli and Samuel. Samuel is probably the one who wrote the book of Judges. He was a prophet. None of the judges ruled over all of the tribes of Israel, but their influence certainly went out to all of Israel. There were some judges who were working in tandem. There were some, I mean, they were working at the same time in different regions. So we'll see where, where Deborah comes from. It's interesting to note that Samuel and Deborah were the only judges or rulers who were also prophets. Among the judges, Deborah was the only woman. And we'll see that she ruled in Israel for 40 years peacefully following the defeat of Sisera. Judges 4, 1 through 5, tells us the story. When Ehud was dead, big surprise here, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just wince. I'm like, oh, again, can't they learn? My heart goes out. <laughs> so the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Harosheth Hagoim. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron. And for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Now Deborah, a prophet or a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. <clears throat> Something about this story. God let a half generation go by before he listened to their cries. 20 years, time for the old people who had a perspective. They, they could see behind and realize what was wrong. Time for the young people to grow into mature people. Sometimes God has to change the generation before things will change in the world. So let's take a look where Deborah was working, where she lived, and the seat from which she was ruling. There's a comparison. The white map is the map that I showed you last week. And you can see the arrow going from the map on the right, which is Deborah's map, her region, the timeline. And it points to the area on the white map where she is, where she was. So the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so they were sold to the Jabin, or the king of Canaan. <clears throat> Judges 4.3. Let me see if I have a slide for this. Hang on. No, this is next, but I'll just leave it up there. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. For Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years... He had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. They had been in this situation of punishment, enduring harsh oppression, 
for 20 years. The people had been being softened toward the Lord while they suffered under a pagan king. The Lord sent Deborah to be the judge over Israel and gave her a plan to rescue Israel and quell the interest of the Jabin. <clears throat> Judges 4, 6 through 10. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor? Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulun. <clears throat> And against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver them into your hand. And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. So she said, Surely I will go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you're taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh. He went up with 10,000 men under his command. And Deborah went up with him. Mm. Now this is very interesting because the terms are clear. She's saying, you take 10,000 because God says he will deploy you against the Jabin's army, but he's also going to deploy Sisera's army against you. So like you know what's coming, but I will deliver them into your hand. 20 years of being under oppression makes you feel like a slave. It takes away your confidence. I think that Barak needed confidence. He was willing to go, but he didn't have quite that, he didn't have that trust yet. It was coming, but it wasn't there yet. Now here's the map again, but this shows you where everybody was stationed. So Jabin, the Jabin or the king of Canaan ruled up in Hazor, down at Mount Tabor was the site of the battle. And Deborah's oak was somewhere between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. It gives you an idea of the countryside. This, this battle surely did not happen overnight. The Bible greatly compacts time. <clears throat> Judges 4.2 says, So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And the commander of the army was Sisera, who dwelt in Harasheth Hagoim. Now, the name Harasheth Hagoim means carving of the nations or silence of the Gentiles. Interesting name. Jabin is a title, like a king. It's not a name. So the Jabin of Canaan ruled in Hazor. So let's see how God is going to lead them into victory. Judges 4, 11 through 16. Now, <clears throat> Heber, the Kenite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the terebinth tree at Za'ani Naim, which is beside Kiddush. And they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera gathered together all his chariots. 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him from Harasheth Hagoim to the river Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from the Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harasheth Hagoim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man 
was left. Remember, not a man was left except Sisera. So Judges 4, 17 through 22. Okay. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was a peace, there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. I know show you the picture, uh, an artist's rendition of this story. Then he said to her, please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the door of the tent, and if any man comes and inquires of you and says, is there a man here, you shall say no. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple and it went down into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary so he died and then as Barak pursued Sisera Jael came out to meet him and said come I will show you the man whom you seek and when he went into her tent there lay Sisera dead with a peg in his temple I don't think that a normal human woman would have the strength all by herself to drive a tent stake through the temple of a man and to put it all the way through his skull down into the ground. This is kind of like a little rock in the forehead of a giant. I believe there was angelic help to give her the strength and the courage to do this. Mm. Judges 4, 23. And 24, so on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. This reminds me of what the angel of the Lord said in the first place back in Exodus. I'm not going to let you destroy everything in one day because the land couldn't support you but you will gradually take the land and you see God does things gradually with us it's one of the things that our generation needs to relearn this is the age of microwave and, and internet connections in a flash and we have short attention spans we, we can't normally read a a long book or or watch a long video something's happening to us and what we need to get back is this ability to wait on the Lord because God is going to move when he's ready not when we demand it God is moving everything to come to a certain point there's a collision coming and he needs to strengthen us and teach us so we go stronger and stronger until we have taken back the territory that we have given up to the non-state actors. And we turn back to the Lord in every sense, like these people were learning to do. Deborah and Barak had a joyful song about the battle. You can read about it in Judges chapter 5. The, the result of this battle, though, was peace. And Deborah entered her song with these words in Judges 5, 31. Thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. So the land had rest for 40 years. So look what God did. He brought them out. He strengthened them. He gave them a judge again. What was irregular about this warfare? The angel of the Lord withdrew from this battle until God had punished Israel. They had been weakened by their idolatry. They had been oppressed by the Jabin of the Canaanites for 20 years. The people had been unwilling to rise up for Israel. There was no unity in the tribes, and they were easy to defeat. 
because there was no voluntary service. Now, compare that to the church today. We have been weakened, and there has been great idolatry in the church. And we have been oppressed. Many churches have been shut down. As we're coming closer and closer to the end of all things, we need to remember that it's the beginning for us. Christ calls for unity. Paul called for unity. We can't have unity while we are pursuing our own plans, while we're defending our own denominations. The church is going to emerge triumphant and pure without spot or wrinkle. We have been redeemed, but there will be a day when that redemption is perfected. And God was giving a foretaste of all of this to the children of Israel, and he kept pulling them along. Finally, the Lord decided that Israel was ready to listen, and he sent help once more in the form of a prophet and a mother. Listen to these words of Deborah in Judges 5, 6, and 9. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. God chose new leaders when war came to the city gates, but not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. People have been chastened and disciplined, but now they needed a firm but tender ministry of a mother of Israel to encourage them to be strong and to return their trust to the Lord. Barak was raised up. He had an interesting name. It means bright lightning or a glittering sword. Barak was sent out as a weapon in the hand of the Lord. Although he didn't completely trust the Lord to help him finish off the hordes of Sisera's army, unless Deborah the prophet went with him. Still he had enough faith to believe that he would win if she was there. To make this point very clear and fulfill the prophetic words that Deborah spoke, God allowed Barak and his men to rout the entire army of Sisera, but he allowed Sisera to escape to the tent of someone that he thought was an ally. God caused the woman to strike down Sisera after giving him a bowl of milk and a comfortable place to sleep. The Lord had allowed Israel to be sold into punishment for disobeying, and now he was picking them up. He was saying, all right, you've been down in the dirt long enough. I think you're ready to go on. Deborah was a prophet whom God called to lead and to judge, and rule. Obviously, she, she was like a general. So she brought the word of the will of God to the people. It's, you know, it's interesting. Barak wasn't happy with these odds that he heard. Oh, you just go out with 10,000 men, and I'm going to bring the general or the captain with all of his iron chariots and all of his hordes. Most of us in the flesh wouldn't like those odds either. But what's interesting is, you know, Barak won the battle. It was just one man short, but it was the head man. And because he didn't completely trust God, a woman got this glory. But I want to have, you know, in defense of Barak, it's clear that he trusted Deborah as a prophet and a leader. So she already had to have a track record. He trusted her. And he wasn't concerned with the glory for the win going to a woman as long as Israel would become free of the yoke of the Jabin. And, I, and actually, although I, I have heard 
preachers tear down Barak because of his attitude, because a man should have been in charge, and this would have been better. There were no, no real men, so God had to choose a woman. All of that is nonsense. This is a miraculous story. The irregular warfare here, God was still working for Israel, and God sent a woman to tell his will. And as always, we will always feel like we're outmatched, outgunned, outmanned. And yet, if we remember that we have the God of all creation behind us, guiding us, carrying us, and assuring our victory, it does not matter what it looks like out there. Because God will make a way. God will keep his promises to us. <clears throat> All right. So the last part is identifying the state versus the non-state actors in this story. We have to always keep in mind the spiritual and the physical standpoint. So we have the Prince Michael, the angel of the Lord, obviously an immortal being able to be physical and living in a certain city, as a matter of fact, among the people. Isn't that mind-blowing? I just think, what an amazing thing that God sent an angel to live among the people back in those days. Mm. Then we have Deborah, the leader, the judge, a prophet of Israel. And then we have Barak and Israel's forces. And then Jael, whom the enemy thought was an ally but who ended up killing Sisera. On the non-state side, we have the worshipers of the Baals and other false deities. We have the Javan or king of Canaan and Sisera and the Canaanite army. Did you have any doubts about anyone? Because I personally thought that when Sisera took shelter with his allies, that they would shield him the very first time I read the story. But Jael turned out not to be an ally. Though she made him feel welcome and safe, you might say she utterly deceived him. And God put it in her heart and strengthened her to have the ability to slay the commander who was delivered into her hands and thereby won the war. And in the overall story, looking at Deborah, she had one major battle that she had to bring about in the transition, in ripping Israel out of the clutches, again, of the Canaanite king. One last battle for 40 years. Think about it. I can't even imagine 40 years of peace. It's an amazing story. And I give thanks to God for these stories that teach us. Everybody has a different calling. Everybody has a different part to play. And my, my true hope is that we will be strengthened, we will learn, we will have faith. And when God says, step out, don't worry about what it looks like, but trust him. Thank you for listening today. I appreciate you being here. And God bless you. See you next week.